Okay, so let's start in on uh, anatomy and physiology. So anatomy and physiology are subsections of biology, which is the study of life. So let's take a look first at anatomy. Anatomy is the study of the structures of living organisms. So what we're interested in here is what the parts are. There are two main types of uh, anatomy. One is gross anatomy, also called macroscopic. Uh, and this is a study of large body structures visible to the naked eye. And next is microscopic anatomy. And this is a study of structures that are not visible to the naked eye, right? So we need a microscope for that, right? So gross anatomy, you don't need a microscope. Microscopic anatomy, you do, all right? Next is physiology. Physiology is the study of the function of living organisms. So what we're looking at here is what the parts do and how they do it, all right? So anatomy, you know, and so uh, is mainly what we're doing in the lab part of this class. We are going to have to get into it a little bit in the lecture part as well because we need to know the anatomy to talk about what it does and how it does it, all right? So in physiology, you know, so anatomy would be like naming the muscles where physiology is uh, looking at what muscles do, what well, muscles contract. And so we're going to spend a lot of time looking at how muscles contract probably, you know, a class period or two on that. All right, so let's take a look at the levels of organization of an organism. And the main organism that we're looking at here is human organism. So we're going to start off with the lowest level of organization, uh, and that is the atomic level. So an atom is the smallest particle of an element that retains the properties of that element. So when we talk about this, you know, we're talking about like uh, carbon, and oxygen, and hydrogen, those are different elements you might know of. We take a, a, a few atoms together, uh, you know, we're gonna make a molecule. So that's the next level, it's a molecular level. And a molecule is a particle composed of two or more joint atoms. And so a molecule can be something very small, like water, which is only made of three atoms, to something very large, like uh, DNA which literally has millions to billions of atoms in it. The next level of molecular organ, or, uh, uh, organismal organization uh, is the organelle level. Organelle basically means small organ. Uh, this is a part of a cell that performs a specialized function. So you look here, here's a cell, it's highlighting mitochondria, produce energy for the cell. The nucleus houses our DNA, so it's a control center of our cell. So above the organelle level is the cellular level. So just showing one simple cell there. And the cells are the structural and functional unit of an organism. So all life is made of cells. We are composed of literally trillions of cells in us. And the simplest living organisms are cells, are single cell organisms. Uh, you take a bunch of cells, put those together. Uh, we have the tissue level. Uh, a tissue is a group of similar cells that have a common function. So this is showing, you know, smooth muscle tissue, their function is to contract. Above that uh, is the organ level. So this is showing uh, the urinary bladder there. So an organ is a structure composed of two more tissue types that perform a specific function. So here's, uh, you know, showing, you know, various tissue types in the wall of the urinary bladder. Above this is the organ system level. So an organ system uh, is a group of organs that work together to accomplish a common purpose. So this is shown the kidneys, ureter, urinary bladder, urethra, that's all part of our urinary system. So our kidneys are gonna clean, filter our blood, they're gonna make urine, and the urine is transported from the kidneys to the urinary bladder by the ureter. We store that urinary, uh, um, urine in the bladder for a little while, and then we release it out of the body through the urethra, all right? Lastly is an organism, uh, and this is an individual living thing. So here we're looking at human organism, cute little baby right here, all right? So uh, the organism is a sum total of all the structural levels working together. All right, so let's take a look at uh, the maintenance of life and start off looking at the requirements of life. So looking at the requirements of life, uh, there are five requirements for life. Uh, the first is water. Right, we uh, um, can live a few days without water. Uh, next is air, specifically oxygen. We can only li live a few minutes without that. Uh, next is food, uh, you know, nutrients. Uh, we can, you know, last a week or more uh, without that. 
The last two are not as intuitively obvious. Uh, so the next is pressure. We need pressure to move stuff through our body. So our blood pressure and osmotic pressure move substances through our body. Uh, lastly is heat. Uh, we need heat uh, to have all these um, uh, chemical reactions that occur in our body, uh, allowing them to occur. So all those things are necessary for our metabolism. This is all the chemical reactions that occur within the cell. Now, that may not sound like, you know, what we think about with metabolism, but um, all those chemical reactions require energy. And so that's what we typically think of with metabolism is energy usage. And they are tied together because those chemical reactions that keep us alive all require energy. Now, we have certain conditions in our body in which we need to be maintained in order for those chemical reactions that, uh, to occur. And this is what is known as homeostasis. And this is a maintenance of internal conditions within certain boundaries. So we need to stay in homeostasis in order to metabolize those. Like I said, those chemical reactions have certain conditions in which they need to occur. So a good example here is our body temperature. Our body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees uh, Celsius, right? So if we get too cold, it's not good for us. If we get too warm, it's not good for us. We stay fairly close at 98.6. So let's look at uh, control of a variable when it comes to homeostasis. And we're going to look at this uh, in terms of um, uh, body temperature. So in our body, we have receptors. And uh, these are going to provide information about specific conditions uh, within the internal environment. Uh, a lot of ways you can think about these, these are sensors like pain receptors, um, touch receptors, uh, temperature receptors in this case. So what they're going to do is those receptors are going to send a signal to what is known as our control center. And our control center is our brain and spinal cord, mainly our brain. And it has determined what is known as a set point. And this is a level or range at which a variable is to be maintained. Like our body temperature is 98.6, but we're always going to be kind of close to that. Next, our, uh, so uh, if anything needs to happen, our control center is going to send out a signal to effectors. And these are organs that are going to cause a response that alters conditions in the internal environment. So let's look at an example uh, of this here. Uh, let's go to this picture here. So normal body temperature is 98.6. If we get too hot, our thermal receptors in our skin are going to send a signal to our brain, specifically a part of our brain called the hypothalamus. It's going to then send a signal out to our body and we start to sweat. Right, so the sweat glands are the receptor or the effectors there, and so that's going to help lower our body temperature until you know we get back to normal. All right, if we get too cold, once again, thermal receptors in our skin send a signal uh, to our hypothalamus, and now uh, we're going to send uh, um, signals to skeletal muscles, and skeletal muscles are going to uh, contract and shivering. And by contracting in that shivering process, that's going to increase heat. And so that hopefully that increases our body temperature back to normal. Okay. So control of a variable. All right. So uh, types of control. So the two major types of control of a variable. One is what is known as a negative feedback mechanism. And so negative feedback mechanism here, the output of a system suppresses or inhibits the activity of the system. All right. So um, uh, your thermostat at home is a really good example of this. So, uh, you know, we're heading into summer here pretty soon. Uh, so if your house thermostat is set at 72, if it gets above 72 degrees in your house, right, that sends a signal to your air conditioning unit, your air conditioning unit turns on, and then it's going to pump cold air into the house until the temperature gets below 72, right? So here, the output of the system, the cold air, is going to inhibit its production, all right? And so we do the same thing here, all right? If we get cold, we're gonna start shivering until our body temperature gets back up to normal, and then we stop shivering, all right? Uh, if we get too hot, we're gonna sweat until, uh, you know, we get too hot, or uh, until uh, our body temperature gets back down to normal again. This is how most homeostatic interactions are controlled is through negative feedback mechanisms. Another way to control a variable is uh, through a positive feedback mechanism. And here, this is the output of the system uh, intensifies and increases the activity of the system, okay? 
So very few uh, cases of positive feedback mechanism. One major case is during the birthing process. So uh, when the head of the fetus pushes against the cervix, it's gonna send a signal up to the brain which causes the release of a hormone called oxytocin. And what oxytocin does is it causes uterine contractions. So the uterus is gonna contract, it's gonna push the baby's head further against the cervix, which then causes more oxytocin secretion, which then causes more uterine contractions, and so on until the baby gets pushed out. Now, uh, witnessing this firsthand, it's a little more complicated than that, but I'm just talking about it in a positive feedback mechanism way. All right, let's look at anatomical terminology. All right, so relative positions here, all right? So relative positions is one body part in relationship to another body part. So uh, the first is superior and inferior. So superior means where a body part is above another body part. So my head is superior to my chest, all right? Next is inferior. Inferior is where a body part is below another body part. So my chest is inferior to my head, right? Uh, my chest though is superior to my waist, my waist is inferior to my chest. So relative there. Next is anterior, also known as ventral, all right? Anterior or ventral means towards the front, posterior dorsal means towards the back, all right? Next is medial and lateral. So medial means closer to the midline, all right, of the body. Uh, lateral means away from the midline or towards the sides. Next is proximal and distal. So this is showing distal is farther from the point of attachment. So like farther out on the arm, proximal is closer to the point of attachment. So like closer to the shoulder there, all right? So uh, the wrist is distal to the elbow. The elbow is proximal to the wrist, okay? Next is superficial and deep. Superficial uh, means towards or at the body surface, where deep means away from the body surface. All right, let's look at body sections. So the first is a sagittal section. So this right here is trying to show a sagittal section. This is a lengthwise cut that divides the body into left and right portions. So this would be a cut this way. Now it doesn't have to be exactly down the middle. It could be off to the sides, but it just divides the body into left and right portions. Next is a tra transverse section, uh, also known as a horizontal cut. This is a cut that divides the body into superior and inferior portions. So a cut this way, all right? Next is a coronal section or frontal section. This is a cut that divides the body into anterior and posterior portions. All right, uh, I don't know how that got up there. So, so this is showing a horizontal, this is showing a, uh, uh, a coronal or frontal section there. All right, so let's take a look at organ sections. So uh, next, is uh, first is a cross section. So this right here is a cross section. They're calling a transverse section in this book. The only book I know that causes that. Okay, so this is showing a cross section there. Uh, this is a longitudinal section. All right, that's a lengthwise cut down the organ. Uh, and then oblique section is an angled cut in that organ.